The Tom Woods Show, episode 1363. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, social media is a pit of misinformation when it comes to the subject of guns. So what you need is my free ebook, Your Facebook Friends Are Wrong About Guns. Smashes all the myths and a lot of fun to read. Pick it up at wrongaboutguns.com. Hello, everybody. Tom Woods here. I am all by myself today, and I want to talk about a topic that I could have sworn I covered at one time or another on this podcast. And so I went and I looked through the episodes, and I found one episode in which I devoted a small portion to this topic. So if you blinked, you would have missed it. So I think this topic does require its own episode because it does come up a lot. And it is the source of a lot of confusion and indeed potential mischief. This is one of these cases where, as Hayek said in his great essay, History and Politics, which appears in his edited volume, Capitalism and the Historians, it really matters that we get history right for a number of reasons, but one of them is when you get history wrong, you tend to get the present wrong also. So that is to say, if I look back on the alleged age of the robber barons and I have completely the wrong idea about that, that's going to influence the way I think about the economy today. And likewise, if I look back at the Great Depression and World War II, and I say World War II lifted the country out of the Great Depression, but that's not correct, then today I might well say, well, Apparently, a whole lot of spending, government spending, lifts countries out of a depression or a recession. And so isn't that what seems to be called for now? So very, very important to address this. And that's what we're going to be doing in this here episode. Let me point out very quickly, we had an issue with uh, one of the team members over here at Tom Woods, Inc. So we fell behind by a day, but we'll still have the five episodes out. But I'm going to do the I just don't have the heart to impose a bonus episode on the folks running the show here. So that bonus episode, I promise you, will come out uh, next weekend on on the church. So if you're interested in that, it will be coming next weekend. You can listen to Contra Krugman, by the way. Don't forget to listen to the podcast I do with Bob Murphy over at ContraKrugman.com. We'll have an episode of that coming out over the weekend as well. So we got this one coming out uh, uh, over the weekend. We got Contra Krugman. We got a bonus episode next weekend. It's just, you know. There's so much content. It's unbelievable. So let's dive into this. And I want to start off by giving credit to a really, really important scholar who has done so much to get people to think about this issue differently. And he's somebody I'm very pleased and proud to say has been a guest on the Tom Woods Show more than once. And that's Robert Higgs a tremendous economic historian, a great economist, a great historian, and a great economic historian. And he's done really, really important work. His books are great. His scholarly articles are great. So what I'm going to do on the show notes page is link to a couple of his works. The most significant one is called Wartime Prosperity, question mark, a reassessment of the U.S. economy in the 1940s. And it originally appeared in the peer-reviewed journal uh, the Journal of Economic History. I'm going to link to that at tomwoods.com slash 1363 so you can read the article for yourself. And then he developed this a bit further and included it in a broader work, a book published by Oxford University Press called Depression, War, and Cold War. This guy really is the person on this subject. I'm also going to link to an article I wrote for the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics back in 2008 called What Austrian Economics Can Teach Historians. And I talk a little bit about the World War II episode as the kind of thing that a historian who understands the economy the way an Austrian school economist does would have looked at this data that allegedly showed great wartime prosperity during the early 1940s, would have looked at it with a jaundiced eye and would have said something is not right here. This can't be correct. I'm looking at a phantom. So that's your homework assignment for those of you who want to be advanced students and learn everything you can. Those are the readings for you. So let's jump in. This is the sort of thing that your friends will say to you a lot. Well, World War II got us out of the Great Depression. And I even hear 
conservatives and even the occasional libertarian say the New Deal did not get us out of the Great Depression. That's clear and obvious. Just a glance at the unemployment statistics is enough to verify that. But then they go on to say World War II did, and I think, oh, oh, and you were doing so well. And what they can do is look at the GDP figures for the wartime years and say, look at this tremendous growth. It's just amazing. Look at how much the economy grew. And unemployment suddenly fell and fell very dramatically. So they say, doesn't that prove it? In fact, they don't even ask. They assert that it proves it. So let's step back. We're going to try and understand what these numbers mean, if indeed they mean anything. So first we start with unemployment. Now Higgs puts it this way. This is a quotation from his uh, paper. He says, during the war, the government pulled the equivalent of 22% of the pre-war labor force into the armed forces. Voila, the unemployment rate dropped to a very low level. No one needs a macroeconomic model to understand this event. So that's Higgs's way of saying, do I need to draw you a diagram? You yank people out of the labor force and go put them in harm's way. And what do you know? These people now are no longer being in the economy. The statistics now show that a greater percentage of people who are still living in the United States and who have not been drafted to go fight the war are employed, right? We have less unemployment when you take a lot of the unemployed and just send them somewhere. Well, yeah. I mean, obviously not everybody drafted was unemployed, but the point is, when you draft 10 million people, take them out of the economy, well, yeah, that does have an effect on uh, unemployment figures. So that's not a big difficulty to uh, understand. But much, much more significant is the following. There are numerous reasons that these GDP figures should have set off alarm bells. They should have set off alarm bells, certainly with economists. I mean, obviously not with historians who are hopeless I say that as a historian myself, I can tell you, they are hopeless. But the economists should have seen a problem. And indeed, Higgs's work has been influential enough that there are now a number of economists who say that maybe Higgs is right, that maybe we did draw the wrong conclusion about what happened in World War II. So let's look at one of the problems. And this is a passage that I quote from Higgs in my article for the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics because I thought it was so, so telling. Now, bear in mind that from the point of view of the labor market, what's going on during the war? You're taking a whole lot of prime workers, you're removing them from the economy altogether, and you're replacing them with people who don't have that much experience or for one reason or another are not as good as the workers you've removed. So when you do something like that, you should expect that the economy will produce not as much, that the economy's output will be less than before. I mean, that would be, that's that's how it has to be. That's just the nature of reality. And yet that's not what happens. So something is screwy here. And so here's what Higgs says. Consider that between 1940 and 1944, real GDP increased at an average annual rate of 13%, a growth spurt wholly out of line with any experienced before or since. Moreover, that extraordinary growth took place notwithstanding the movement of some 16 million men, equivalent to 28.6% of the total labor force of 1940, into the armed forces at some time during the war, and the replacement of those prime workers, mainly by teenagers, women with little or no previous experience in the labor market, and elderly men. And here's the key thing. Is it plausible that an economy subject to such severe and abruptly imposed human resource constraints could generate a growth spurt far greater than any other in its entire history. Further, is it plausible that when the great majority of the servicemen returned to the civilian labor force, some nine million of them in the year following VJ Day, While millions of their relatively unproductive wartime replacements left the labor force, the economy's real output would fall by 22% from 1945 to 1947. So his point is, when you look at the national income accounting figures, it makes it seem as if during these years of abruptly imposed human resource constraints, the economy exploded. But when these human resource constraints were removed, and the best workers were returned to the economy, the bottom fell out, everything went bad. That's obviously the opposite 
of what logic would demand and what common sense would lead you to expect. So something must be screwy here. Another thing, we happen to know that the year 1946 was the single greatest year in economic history from the point of view of production. Private production increased by 30% in one year. That's astonishing. That's nothing like that has ever occurred. But if you look at the national income accounting figures, you would be led to believe that there was a terrible depression in 1946. But you know that that's not true. You know it's not true. You can look at the newspaper accounts from 1946. Nobody's talking about a depression. It's the year in which we see the greatest growth in private production ever. So something screwy about the numbers. In fact, Richard Vetter and Lowell Galloway, two economists, wrote uh, an article with a sort of satirical title, The Great Depression of 1946. Maybe I'll, you know what, I'm going to put that one on there too. Great Depression of 1946. I'll add that to the show notes page too. Because obviously their point is there was no Great Depression of 1946. But if you're going to accept these crazy numbers, if you're going to accept these numbers to tell you that World War II gave the country great prosperity, then you have to accept those numbers when they also say that the year that we independently know was the greatest year in American economic history was actually a year of terrible depression. Something's wrong with the numbers. Then in Higgs's work, he has a chart, and you really more or less need to see it. But just to give you the basic idea of what's being conveyed in this uh, graph, the gist of it is he's drawing a trend line from 1929 to around 1948 or so. And he's showing, you know, w- w- the the way the economy might have proceeded had there not been a Great Depression. You know, we had the resources, we had the capital, we had the labor to, you know, because all those things were idle in the 1930s. A lot of those things were idle. That's what unemployment is. Unemployment of resources is when things are sitting around idle. And he's saying we had the physical capacity to do a certain amount, to accomplish a certain amount, to have to generate a certain amount of output. But we didn't during the, the Depression. So let's look at 1929. We'll treat that as a normal year. We'll treat 1948 as a, as a normal year. And we'll, we'll draw a line from one to the other. And that's the trend line. And that's the capacity line of the economy. And what he's arguing is that during the Great Depression, we went below the trend. We went below the capacity line. But during World War II, the economy went above the capacity line. And he says, now, anybody looking at this seriously should, again, have smelled a rat. Because how can you – it's not conceivable that you could go above a capacity line. Capacity is what it is. It's the limitation on what you're capable of doing. So to say, oh, we went above that during these years is not reasonable. We, we, you can't go, but I mean, it would almost be like me saying that I started to fly or I, I was, I no longer, you know, today during World War II, I didn't feel constrained by the law of gravity anymore. You, you would think I'd lost my mind. Well, this isn't quite as preposterous, but it's close. So um, you're going to need to look at that. I'm pretty sure it's in the Journal of Economic History article and you'll see more clearly. It's, it's, it's kind of hard to do to describe it just verbally. But his point is there are all kinds of red flags all over these numbers. Why weren't people looking more carefully at these numbers? There's something wrong with them. These numbers that tell us that the economy was so great during World War II, there's something wrong with them. And in a minute, we're going to look at exactly what it is that was wrong with them. First, though, I want to remind all you good listeners, all of you are responsible people right? Liberty and responsibility, they go hand in hand. And part of being a responsible person involves getting life insurance. And sometimes it feels like putting together the world's worst jigsaw puzzle. It's confusing, takes forever. But if you have a mortgage or kids or anybody who depends on your income, this is a puzzle you need to solve. And a great way to do it is with an online service called Policy Genius. Policy Genius is the easy way to get life insurance. Just two minutes, you can compare quotes from top insurers and they'll find the best policy for you. And when you apply online, the advisors at Policy Genius will actually handle all the red tape. They'll negotiate your rate with the insurance company. You don't have to deal with commissioned sales agents. 
You don't have to worry about any hidden fees. You just get helpful advice and personalized service. And they do more than just life insurance, by the way. They also make it easy to find the right home insurance, auto insurance, or even disability insurance. They're your one-stop shop for financial protection. So if you find life insurance puzzling, head to policygenius.com. In two minutes, you can compare quotes, find the right policy, and save up to 40% doing it. Policy Genius, the easy way to compare and buy life insurance. All right, now back into this stuff. Let's step back for a minute and just remind ourselves what an economy is for. What is the economy for? The economy is for us. The economy is for our material well-being. That's why we have it. That's why we have the International Division of Labor. So when we look at economic figures, we want to know what do they actually mean for your and my material welfare? So if the government spends a lot of money on arbitrary things and then adds that to GDP, does that mean you're better off and I'm better off? Not necessarily, and almost certainly not. So simply to say, well, there was an awful lot of, quote, spending going on during the war years, what does that mean? Spending on what? Was the spending on things that benefited the consumer? that contributed to consumer welfare. Now, yes, there's an awful lot of military spending that's going on. And you could well say, Woods, we needed that military spending in order to win the war. Well, that's a separate question. That could well be true. But the point is, from the point of view of economic statistics, we're trying to understand what was the effect on the average person. Because they're not just saying, people who say that World War II solved the Depression and was a time of prosperity, they're not just saying, World War II helped, you know, the the, um, economic activity of World War II helped us win the war. That is not what they're saying. They're saying it made people richer. That's what they're saying. It was a time of prosperity. They're not saying it it was a time of victory, which it was. They're saying it was a time of prosperity. So that's what we need to test. Was it a time of prosperity? If you suck huge amounts of resources out of the economy and the private economy shrinks, In other words, the part of the economy that actually produces the goods that you and I buy, there's no way that can make us richer. So if if I just suck a lot of resources out of the economy and then I go blow them up or I just go dump them into the ocean, that doesn't make us richer even though the GDP figures may look really good. That makes us poorer because I'm depriving the private sector of a whole lot of resources, both physical and human. So first of all, right away, this more or less invalidates these crazy figures. But secondly, how do they arrive at the prices of so many of the goods that are going into calculating these figures? A huge, huge chunk of the economy was dedicated to war and war production at that time. Now, how are those prices determined? We know that what what Higgs is saying is that economists and economic historians are expecting us to believe that the price of, say, a, a war plane is arrived at in the same way as the price of breakfast cereal. But that's obviously not correct. The price of breakfast cereal is arrived at on a free market in which buyers and sellers interact with each other voluntarily and in which buyers can decide to buy breakfast cereal or not. Whereas with these military purchases, these prices are not, this is no free market. It's the government, which right away automatically makes it not a free market, making purchases On a negotiated basis, they sit down and they negotiate the price, and the resulting number has nothing to do with supply, demand, or consumer welfare. This is not telling us anything about real output. It's just a bunch of arbitrary numbers, and when you add up a bunch of arbitrary numbers, you get a giant arbitrary number. There's nothing meaningful about these prices because they're not formed on a market. So the overall point is that The production that's going on during the war is a lot of it, a huge chunk of it, is not geared toward things ordinary people needed. It made consumers worse off because it diverted capital and other resources to goods that no consumer would want to buy. And moreover, in the last couple of years of the war, it was two-fifths of the labor force that was producing neither consumer goods nor capital goods. So we're talking about the armed forces – civilian employees of the armed forces people who and people who worked in the military supply industries and the you know relatively few unemployed two-fifths of the labor force are not contributing anything 
to consumer welfare whatsoever. Now, again, you may say, yeah, but they're contributing to the winning of the war. But that's not the argument that the World War II gave us prosperity people are making. They're saying that the war made us rich. They're not just saying the war made us win the war, whatever that would mean. They're saying the war made us rich. So it makes us rich if 40% of the labor force is producing stuff nobody wants. I mean, in effect, they might as well just be gathering up resources and burning it. You're saying that makes us rich? And also the tax money of the 60% is going to fund the 40%. It's basically 60% of the people are funding 40% of the people to do nothing that contributes to consumer welfare. So that is a loss in material wealth. But now going back to this this problem of what these prices mean and the fact that you had a basically command economy during the war, Higgs says this, in a command economy, the fundamental accounting difficulty is that the authorities suppress and replace the only genuinely meaningful manifestation of people's valuations, namely free market prices. So the prices that the U.S. government paid for the goods and services it bought were basically arbitrary. They had no foundation in consumer choice, as all other prices do. The greater the government's coercive power over the economy, the less meaningful in terms of consumer welfare its output statistics become. And then the more of the economy that the government places into the command system, the more tainted by arbitrariness do the output figures become. So Higgs concludes, the apparent super trend wartime boom in output was nothing but an artifact of an unjustifiable accounting system. And then when we think about just ordinary people and what the war meant for their welfare, remember, they can't buy a whole series of of goods at all. So, uh, for instance, the government had forbidden entirely the production of new cars. Nobody during the war could buy a new car or a new house or a major appliance. And a great many other goods were either unavailable or very difficult to obtain. So anything from chocolate bars and sugar to meat, gasoline and rubber tires, you had rationing. And then, of course, you had all the inefficiencies of that. You got ration coupons and People don't necessarily want what they're entitled to and they want extra of other things. And so a black market developed. And so this is all inefficient uh, behavior going on. The average work week in manufacturing increased by seven hours during 1940 and 1944 and in bituminous coal mining by a full 50%. So why would you think this was a time of prosperity? It doesn't seem to make sense on any level. You're absorbing resources and then doing the equivalent of just throwing them in the ocean. And the best we can come up with, I think, is uh, what George Reisman says, which is people believed they were prosperous in World War II because they were piling up large amounts of unspendable income in the form of paper money and government bonds. They confused this accumulation of paper assets with real wealth. Incredibly, most economic statisticians and historians make the same error – when they measure the standard of living of World War II by the largely unspendable, quote, national income of the period. So the moral of the story is, if some series of statistics tries to tell you that under conditions when your prime workers are removed from the economy and replaced by unexperienced, less skilled workers, and the economy booms, well, Something's wrong with those numbers. Likewise, when a series of numbers tells you that the single greatest year in the history of the United States economy was actually a depression year, but the years in which we took 40% of our labor force and devoted them to doing things that did absolutely nothing for consumer welfare, and then we taxed the other 60% to pay those people to do that thing, when we're told that the net result of that was a great boom in prosperity, there's something wrong with the numbers, okay? That is our lesson for today. All right, folks, before we wrap up for this week, let me tell you about a new blog and podcast created by a Tom Wood Show listener, and it's called cavetothecross.com. The idea behind it is that for the past several years, the two gentlemen who run it have been uh, reading s- some Christian book or book of philosophy and discussing it, and uh, one of them has a PhD in philosophy, and 
they're both Christians who have an interest in Christian apologetics, and they decided they enjoyed it so much that they would share their book club with anybody who wants to join them. So they break down a philosophy or theology book or article or video for a general viewing audience, and somebody can take the book uh, they're going through chapter by chapter or just watch or listen to the episodes or short clips. So you can find out about that if that interests you at cavetothecross.com, and I'll link to that at tomwoods.com slash 1363. And I remind you that you can get, they're going to get some nice traffic from this, right? They're they're not just going to have tumbleweeds going by. They're going to get some nice traffic from this because my listeners tend to check out the sorts of things that I recommend, and some of them have an interest in this sort of thing. And they're able to get publicity like this, which, you know, you can't put a price tag on. They get this as a free bonus because they got their web hosting through my link. And they get this plus membership in my bloggers group and plus a whole bunch of tutorials to get you up and running as a blogger. Really great free resources I'm giving you. Uh, And if you'd like to avail yourselves of them, then check out tomwoods.com slash publicity. See you next week. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free and we'll see you next time.